Hello, and welcome to the Heart of Fiat Crucified Love. This week, we are going to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is being a failure. <laughs> Why is that my favorite? Because it's the reality, oftentimes in, the li in life, this side of eternity, is um, having our plans not work out, or what we think God wants of us not working out. And we can look to the lives of many saints who honestly and in a holy way sought to do the will of God and failed at what they thought that was. But they're still saints, right? And ultimately, our example in this is Jesus crucified. You know, he came to earth and this sort of looked like a failure, didn't it? But it wasn't. So we're going to talk about the wisdom of God in all of that. Um, and we'll start with a prayer, and I chose a children's song. I think I got it from one of the kids at a Bible school or something years ago. Um, and it's just, use me, Lord, use me, right? And it doesn't matter how, and it doesn't matter if he wants to, you know, let us fall and use those falls, or if he wants to give us grace to stand and to rise and to do some big work for him. It's whatever is according to his will, right? So we shouldn't fear when it looks like something is a failure, if it's all surrendered to him. And I cut my finger this morning. I put cabbage in the um, crock pot and I cut my thumb and that's what I pick with. So I hope I can play the song, but it's not a concert. <laughs> it's a prayer, right? So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit. life. 
of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among all women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. All you holy angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen, alleluia. And I want to open this time together with scripture, which is also a prayer. I mean, everything that we do here is kind of a prayer, at least the way that I work, right? <laughs> but I want to read this passage from St. Paul to the Corinthians. Consider your own calling, brothers. I know it by heart, but I want to make sure I don't get it wrong. Consider your own calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were powerful. And not many of you were of noble birth. Rather, God chose the foolish of the world to shame the wise. And God chose the weak of the world to shame the strong. And God chose the lowly and the despised of the world, those who count for nothing, to reduce to nothing those who are something, so that no human being might boast before God. And from the second Corinthians, St. Paul says, If I must boast, I will boast of my, the things that show my weakness, right? Five times at the hands of the Jews, I received 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I passed a night and a day on the deep and frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own race, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, Dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers among false brothers in toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, through hunger and thirst, through frequent fasting, through cold and exposure. And apart from these things, there is the daily pressure upon me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is led into sin and I am not indignant? Although if I wish to boast, I would not be foolish, for I would be telling the truth, but I refrain so that no one may think more of me than what he sees in me or hears from me, because of the abundance of the revelations. Therefore, therefore, that I might not become too elated, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, an angel of Satan to beat me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I begged the Lord about this, that it might leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. I will rather boast more gladly of my weakness in order that the power of Christ might dwell in me. Therefore, I'm content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, constraints for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, I am strong. And he said earlier on in that letter, we hold this treasure in earthen vessels, that the surpassing power may be of God and not from us. We're afflicted in every way, but we're not constrained. We're perplexed, but we're not driven to despair. We're persecuted, but we're not abandoned. We're struck down but we're not destroyed. We are always caring about in the body, the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our body. 
For we who live are constantly being given up to death for the sake of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our mortal flesh. So beautiful. So what does it mean to be a failure for Christ, right? <laughs> St. Paul didn't mind. It did, that was not a list of successes that I just read to you from St. Paul. It was a list of his sufferings and his rejection and kind of his failure. What does it mean to be a failure for Christ? Padre Pio said, if you should fail, be humble. Make a resolution to be submissive to God's will and then get up and carry on, right? Don't dwell in it. St. Hosea Maria Escriva said, so you have failed? You cannot fail. You have gained experience. Go forward. And John Paul II, Pope St. John Paul II said, we are not the sum of our weaknesses and failures. We are the sum of the Father's love for us. I think that's what St. Paul me meant in the end where he said, you know, we're continually given up to death so that the life of Christ can live within us, right? Many of the saints would look in a human way to have failed in life. You know, and so often, you know, I look at the past of my life and how many things that people could say that I just failed, right? When I was little, all I wanted was to get married and have a jillion children. Well, I failed at that. <laughs> I'm 43, so I don't think that's happening, right? Jesus made it very clear that he wanted me to be his, right? And, um, and to choose him above and beyond that natural desire. And then I thought, okay, good. I will give my whole life to the missions. And I went off and I thought I would give my whole life to Russia. And in two years, that mission failed and it closed, but it didn't. Seeds were planted. The prayers that we prayed there are still bearing fruit. And I still have relationships back there. And I could tell you about, you know, I went to Nigeria and I was working with the bishop there and all of a sudden the Muslims started killing everyone. They still are, the Christians. And I had to flee. Didn't look like a successful mission. I remember places where I worked with people for years, teaching them chastity and the vocation of woman, only to leave and find out six months later that they became pregnant as unwed mothers. I thought, did they not listen to anything I was teaching them? <laughs> but at least they kept their babies, right? And then I went on to become a hermit. And I was sure that the Lord wanted me to spend my whole life in that, in that vocation. And I, I ceased to have the support of the church and from people with, with finances. And I had to go back to the world. Was it God's will? Not exactly, right? But he did something better. He's doing something better. You know, I wrote this book that had all of these great reviews. Is it selling like hotcakes in English? Not really. Why? I don't know the wisdom of God. The same thing happened to St. Louis de Montfort when he wrote True Devotion to Mary. The devil squashed it. He allowed people's hearts to be hard, and then he hid it away from people's attention for 150 years. God's way is not our way, right? But it is bearing fruit in Pakistan, where I can't see it. You know, the Lord set up and had me open, you know, people wanted my icons. I opened this artist shop and my music, and I put it out there. Is it really selling? No. <laughs> The Lord wanted to provide for me through donations, and I set up an account. Am I getting donations? No. <laughs> Does it mean I failed Christ? No. I'm not held accountable for other people's reactions. All I'm held accountable is to do the work that God has asked of me, 
to plant the seeds, to give the opportunity. Before I read you the saints that I have written on this list, actually, I'm going to stand up. I'm sorry, but it's my podcast. I can do that. And I'm going to grab this saint that I forgot to add over here. I'm looking at her, smiling at me, and I love her. Her name is Saint Sarah Selkahazi. And I discovered her many years ago. My little niece, Sarah, wanted to know if she had a special patron saint. Sarah Salkahazi, I believe, was from Hungary. It was one of the, um, the countries that was in the communist bloc, right? But I believe it was Hungary, but I might be wrong. It might have been Czechoslovakia or something. I'll put her here, too. And um, she became a religious sister, but she was... Um, persecuted and she was thrown out of the convent for a whole year and what she did is she lived the exact same way that she lived in the convent right she couldn't control what was done to her but she could control her reaction you know and you look at like some of the great saints like Edith and, and Saint Sarah Selkahazi took in these um these young women and help them during the war. And she was in journalism and they killed her for it. She got killed um, during, you know, by the, the Nazis, I believe, um, for her goodness and her work. And you think about St. Edith Stein, who had this brilliant philosopher and teacher, and then, you know, went into a convent. She gave that up, sort of looked like a failure, but it wasn't. And she wrote, wrote her greatest work in the contemplative Carmel, in the cloister. And then it looked like a failure again when they captured her and killed her, right? But the blood of martyrs is a seed of faith. And because of her witness and her suffering, people are buying the book that I wrote based on her teaching of women. And it's changing their hearts. There's so many examples of people that would seem to have been a failure in the eyes of the world, but really weren't, right? St. Maximilian Kolbe was another. And he started, you know, the militia of the Immaculata, and he would do these, you know, this writing and this printing that was spread all over into Eastern Asia. And he was captured and he gave his life out, up you know, some people would say, what would have happened on earth if St. Maximilian Kolbe would have lived and hadn't done that? I believe more grace was given to us through his death because that's the way God works, right? God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And we can't see his work this side of eternity. Another example from St. Louis de Montfort was um, there's a very little known story, but I've read um, biographies on his life. There was a point where he always wanted to build a great shrine to Our Lady um, to, for the Rosary and to Calvary and to have a big hill and on the top of the hill to have this big crucifix with statues of Mary and John and Mary Magdalene. And then around it, he wanted to have the Rosary in trees and flowers. And eventually he found um, a land when he was assigned to a mission and the people were willing and they spent months and months, short of a year, I believe. And they had to carry dirt by hand up to build up this mountain. And they all volunteered. I mean, it was hours and hours of gruesome work that they spent hundreds of people carrying this up you know, carrying the, the cement or the rocks or whatever they needed. And then they brought these big trees and the big trees were planted as the Our Fathers and the little were as the Hail Marys. And they went around the whole hill so that the, there was a living rosary of, of trees and of flowers. And he had the bishop's blessing on it. And the bishop promised to come and bless it when it was finished. So when it was all finished, all these people were excited and they set up the opening day and there were going to be masses and talks and, you know, prayers and this whole festivity. And the morning that the bishop was to arrive, he received word that the bishop said, destroy it. I won't come. 
he wasn't sure that was really from God. He thought it was from Satan. And I'll tell you, as he built it, people would see him randomly talking to the most beautiful woman. And they knew that it was Our Lady would come and guide him how to do it. So this work was from God. Jesus and Our Lady wanted it. And he provided for it. But they did eventually allow the sin of man to ruin it. And we have to believe that it was only because God knew that that sacrifice, an example of St. Louis de Montfort, would bear fruit in even more souls being saved. That the story would build a calvary and a rosary within the hearts of people for ages to come. So St. Louis de Montfort didn't know what that was. So they went on with the festivities and the mass to bless it and everything. And St. Louis set out for 30 miles on foot to reach the bishop's quarters and to ask. And when he walked in, the bishop said, yes, I said, destroy it. I don't want it. And he didn't give an explanation for his change in mind. And he expected St. Louis to blow up in anger, but he was very humble. He didn't act as if anything was wrong. He said, okay, Bishop. He turned around and he walked back 30 more miles, 60 miles in like 24 or 36 hours he walked. It was incredible. And when he got there, he told them to stop the festivities. The Bishop immediately sent St. Louis de Montfort to a different mission and sent a different priest who forced the people who had spent all of this time, these months and months and months of building to piece by piece go and destroy their work. It looked like a failure, didn't it? But God's wisdom is in that sometimes. St. Joan of Arc is another one that people could say looked like a failure. You know, God gave her a mission to lead the army in France, to go to the king of France. It did sound crazy. And when people fought against her, she remained courageous and she heard the Lord say to her, I will save you. So she thought she would be saved. And she ended up getting burnt at the stake. It would look like a failure that she did something wrong. Even if, you know, sometimes God allows us to be martyred, why did she hear him promise to save her? Was it a, a false fallacy? No. God did save her through death and he defended her. And after her death, she was raised to the altars and has been the instrument of many, many souls to, to reach heaven through her prayer, through her example. And in many ways, she saved France. St. Bridget of Sweden, some people say could be called the patron saint of failures. And I have a big devotion to her because of the St. Bridget prayers that they recommend that you pray. And she received a revelation of 15 prayers that you pray every day with an Our Father and Hail Mary. And after one year of doing this, there are great promises that are granted to you. Well, I started when I was 16. I've probably prayed it six or seven or eight times at this point. I've prayed them for myself and then for other people to receive those graces instead of me, right? But she had a beautiful life, but she never lived to see the fulfillment of the religious order that Jesus told her to found, the Bridgetines, right? When she was in her early 40s, the husband that she really loved died and she suffered terribly from it. But she was ready to accept the will of God for whatever he wanted for the rest of her life. And he told her to found the Bridgetines, a religious community. And he directly appeared to her and told her all about this, right? She received visions from God and he told her directly that he wanted her to be his bride and his channel, his, his channel, his channel, say, or canal, I guess, I'm sorry, I mispronounced it, um, of water, you know, that would be like an aqueduct that would bring grace, a, a, a means for grace to come to other people. And he said that the new order she, res she founded would restore the church. But many of the orders that he gave her got delayed. 
He also appeared to her and asked her to help him bring the papacy back to Rome. You know, the Pope wasn't doing the will of God and had left Rome. He had gone to France and she went to talk to him. She went on this mission, but she never saw it completed. She died. She wanted to be a bride of Christ in the monastery she founded. But in 1373, she died without seeing anything she was told to fulfill happen before her death. Was she a failure? No. Sometimes God has sacrifice. Sometimes God perfects our humility by not showing us the fruit. God's timing and ways is not our ways. God called her to two vocations in her life, and she fulfilled each one, but in a different way. She was a mother, and then she was his bride and his love, just not officially in a religious community. St. Gemma Gilgani was the same way. She was called to the Passionists, but the hardness of their heart they rejected her because she was ill. But she was ill because she was a victim soul suffering the passion of Christ. She had the stigmata. But they rejected her. Was she a failure? No. When she died, the passionists took her as a patron. She's an inspiration for them. Did God want them to reject her? No. Did God want people to to abuse St. Paul? No, it's their sin. They're held accountable for it. But he can use that when it's united to the cross to do an even greater work because God is that incredible, right? Then we turn to my one of my very favorites, Charles de Foucault. And I have an icon here of Charles de Foucault. His whole mission seemed like a failure. Look at him. He went down into Algeria and Morocco and he, he ended up after living in a monastery, um, he ended up going down there and living as a hermit in a Muslim area. So he was like the only Christian in that whole area, perhaps in the whole country, I don't remember the details. And every day he prayed that God would send him brothers so he could found a religious community. And he would weep and say, I must not be holy enough yet, Lord, because you won't send me brothers. And he prayed and he prayed and he never saw fruit of his work. And one day at the end, the Muslims came and they murdered him. And after he died, I think it's like 22 or 23 religious communities have been raised up who consider him their founder, who took his spirituality. He bore incredible fruit, but it wasn't in God's way. Sometimes God just asks us to be faithful little by little to what he asks of us. And it's up to him to decide when and where and why and how he's going to bear that fruit. St. Francis Xavier also did not have the success that we remember him. You know, we think of him as a champion of the missions. But he was both internally and externally um, considered a failure, you know, in his own time. He considered himself and so did others. Every time he wrote a letter back home, it was it's kind of, a, he was abandoned or rejected. There's like an isolation or a loneliness that he felt. You know, he had the capacity for friendship, but people didn't always respond the way that God wanted them to, right? When he writes to his brothers in Europe, he says, I would gladly write to each one of you if I could, but I can't. And he always would seek for responses, um, you know, even like when he would write to his friend in India and like they would all reject him. So he turned to Jesus to be the only friend that wouldn't reject him. He really, really wanted to go to China, right? And everything that he tried to do that he felt called to seemed to fail.
I'm sorry. He was able to go all the way to, I wanted to make sure, Southeast Asia, but he kept missing the opportunity to get to China. On one point, he was on a boat setting sail for China. He was that close. And then he realized that he left his essential paperwork at the port. Can you imagine? It's like forgetting your wallet or your passport. He waited and waited for the opportunity to preach to China. And he died of a fever while waiting. He didn't feel like he was a success. But what an inspiration. What great work he did for the Lord that he didn't even realize he was doing. The thousands and thousands and thousands that he did baptize, right? Henry Newman, I have his little um, relic here. Cardinal Henry New John Henry Newman was also considered a great failure, right? What he says is all through life, things happen to me that don't happen to other people. And I feel like a scapegoat. He saw himself as a failure, that all these bad things kept happening and he just couldn't succeed. He said that in his own life, time had been fritted away. How much he must have, he would have been able to do if he had only pursued one subject well. He said that his life seemed to just be a history of failures. He said he had been so often bulked, brought un into undertakings, and then left in the lurch that plan after plan had crumbled in his hands and come to naught. When he was 60 years old, he said that although it wasn't true to the letter. He felt like he could say he had received no piece of personal good news for 30 years or more. He hadn't received one piece of good news for 30 years personally, right? He had nothing but sorrow and anxiety. All his work had failed. When he was an Anglican, everything he did failed. When he became Catholic, the same thing happened. But he said that he believed that the rule of God's providence was that we should succeed by failures, right? We should succeed by failures, by being weak, by allowing ourselves to fail, by giving it to God and then letting him do with it what he wills. You know, you look at the example of wheat. It has to be planted as a seed in the ground. It's hidden, it's dark, it looks like nothing. Then it sprouts life, right? And then what happens? People come and they cut it down and it's taken and it's ground and it's sifted. Then it's mixed up, you know, with other ingredients and it's left alone and abandoned to rise with the yeast. And then it's put in an oven and it's fired, it's baked. Only then does it feed anyone. That's our life. Look at wine. You have the grapes that are taken and they're crushed, right? They're left to what people would say is, is um, be destroyed through fermentation. But through that, great wine is made. And then what happens? People throw it aside for years and years because aged wine tastes better. That happens to the lives of the saints. When St. Francis of Assisi went on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, he returned and found that the vicars of his community had changed the whole Franciscan community. Francis was shocked to find his brothers living in a wealthy monastery in Bologna. His whole purpose was poverty, right? His dream of a community completely dedicated to poverty seemed to have been destroyed. And he worked the rest of his life to restore that vision. Sometimes God allows somebody to make a mistake so that it can be healed. So for example, he can allow somebody to, you know, why does he allow um, a priest to preach something that's not true Catholic doctrine, right? Or someone in the hierarchy of the church. Because then other voices, people start looking for truth. When I was at the university, I did not like having some classes where things were taught that were not Catholic. 
and they said they were Catholic, you know? There are, you know, examples in today's world of people saying, you know, sure, go ahead, you know, vote for abortion, support it. You know, you can be Catholic. It's not true. Why does God allow people to lie and confuse people's consciences, right? Why did I hear heresy about scripture taught as Catholic that wasn't? It would have been easier to go to a university where I was spoon-fed only solid theology. But I had that growing up. I had the foundation. Sometimes God allows people to come against us or to be questioned so that other voices can come out and clarify it. So at Notre Dame, I had to go and knock on the door of the solid professors and say, help me find where the church teaches us. And I read every encyclical of Pope John Paul II so that I knew what the church really taught, right? You know, I went out and said, what does Aquinas say on this? You know, what does the church teach on scripture? So I could go back to the class and present the true teaching, even if the, the professor rejected it, other people there heard it, you know, and it strengthened it within me. You know, sometimes somebody can teach something that's not true, and then other priests and bishops can come and say, no, this is the truth. And they will clarify it so well and so beautifully. They will preach the truth that more souls will be brought to the truth than if the negative never happened. During the time of the Protestant Reformation, when you know Luther left the church and preached heresy, so many Catholics were brought to the church because great saints were raised up to clarify where he was wrong. It's during the time of heresy that God brings doctors of the church to repair that wound. So sometimes when something looks like a failure, it's not. God is allowing the wound because through the medication, you'll become even stronger right? That's what happened with Cardinal Newman. It would happen with Francis of Assisi. Charles Borromeo, he wanted to throw a, a jubilee celebration in his home city of Milan. He worked tirelessly to bring this about until his dream came to fruition. Several people came from all over the region to celebrate, but also they brought the plague. Charles emptied out all of his and the church's treasury to deal with the crisis. It didn't seem like a success. Everyone got sick. But God showed the generosity of this great bishop. He raised up great saints. And remember, the purpose of life is to be a saint. Saint Mother Teresa used to always say, we're not called to be successful. We're called to be faithful. She was given a, tr a building in California once by very rich people so that she could set up a house for AIDS patients. And they spent like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars renovating it. They put brand new carpet throughout the whole thing. Well, she had a rule that they would have wood floors, you know, something they could quickly clean with a mop. And they said, you know, but this is donated and you have to accept it. And she said, no, that's not poverty. That's not what we live and take it all out. And someone said, Mother Teresa, with that attitude, you'll never be successful. You know, you're going to fail. And she said her famous line, we're not called to be successful. We're called to be faithful. We're called to be faithful to what the Lord has asked of us. It's his deal to bear fruit or not, right? There's another example of, from the, um, the, we just this past week celebrated the North American martyrs, right? Isaac Jogues and his uh, companions. And I actually didn't know this story until this past week, but there is a saint that was part of his group called Saint Noel Charbonnel. And Father Noel had a terrible time adapting himself to the mission fields. He, would, he seemed like a failure in his time. He couldn't grasp the language of the natives. He couldn't even talk to them. He hated the food. He never was comfortable with the living conditions. 
He was going through a period of spiritual dryness and trial. And deciding to go completely on faith, he vowed before the Blessed Sacrament that if necessary, he would spend the rest of his life at this work that he hated. He survived a massacre of Christian Hurons by pagan Iroquois and was leading a group of survivors to safety. So it looked like, you know, God was protecting them and leading them to safety when he was murdered by an apostate Huron. So nothing seemed to be from God, right? And I also think of one of my favorite saints. I don't know a whole lot about her life. But, you know, she was sent to deal with the Indians out west in the United States. Think Rose Philippine Duchesne. I couldn't remember her name at once. And she couldn't learn the language. I hope that's the right one. I'm almost positive it is. But she couldn't learn the language. So she was sent to deal with these people and she couldn't communicate. So she'd sit in front of the Blessed Sacrament and pray. Well, the Indians began to call her by a name that meant the woman who prayed. It's so beautiful. I always wanted to be that, that people to call me the woman who prayed. And she was such an example spending her life in prayer. That was her gift. And, you know, we think too of St. Rita who, you know, had this husband and these children who totally, you know, were doing terrible things. And she, you know, was offering up her life for them. And they died. It was God's way of saving their souls. They converted. They didn't leave the faith. You know, her husband converted. Her children died before they could leave the faith. But it seemed like a failure. Couldn't God just convert them? Then she wanted to become a sister and they kept turning her away. Some people called her mad. It looked like a failure. And then one day, God literally mystically picked her up and put her in the monastery. She did not know. She like, not just bilocated, like translocated. <laughs> she ended up there. And she was a great witness. You know, sometimes we do see at the end of a saint's life where something, you know, is according to his will, that there's a stamp of God's approval. You know, St. Francis of Assisi got the stigmata at the end. Or they die and there's a fragrance of roses, right? St. Rita had the thorn in her head. But sometimes we don't see it until after their death. Another somebody who's, you know, I think her cause is open for um, beatification, but she is a very influential woman in um, the Western Church, was Catherine Doherty, and I really love her. She came from Russia, and she was married. She was a baroness. She was very wealthy, and um, she ended up, you know, being in refugee camps and found her way to Canada. Her marriage failed. She got an annulment, so she looked like a failure. She went from really rich to really poor. Her marriage fell apart. Then she started to, to speak, and she got um, a job as a speaker, and she got very famous and started making a lot of money. And then she realized the Lord asked her to go live with the poor, to give that away. And she decided to found what she called friendship houses, very similar to Dorothy Day, and she would live and pray with the poor. And she founded a few of these, and then they kicked her out. It looked like a failure. And then she spoke to a bishop up in Combamir, Canada. And she founded Madonna House. It's very beautiful. But one of the things that she wrote is what I want to read to you here. And then we'll talk about Jesus crucified and we'll be done. And it's something she wrote called, It's All Right to Be a Failure. It's all right to be a failure. She says, I would like to talk about failure. In this strange world of North America, in Canada and the United States, failure is seen as the end of the road. And it's a strange thing, isn't it, for Christians? Look at the crucifix, right? Look at the crucifix here. Look at the cross, this image of Jesus crucified to my left. Look at the crucifix. Can you think of any failure greater than this? 
The people in Christ's time saw him as a great prophet. Some of them expected him to become the king of the Jews. Then they saw him crucified like a criminal. For them, it looked like the greatest failure in the whole world. Has it ever occurred to you that a life without failure is a dead life? Because you learn by failing. If you don't try things, you'll never learn anything. You'll never accomplish anything. But when we fail, what happens? Oh my God, oh, oh, give me a psychiatrist. Give me something, I'm a failure, I'm a failure, I'm a failure, we yell. I fervently hope that every member of the Madonna House fails at least once a week, in little things and in big things. Only then will they learn what it is to live. You know, it's an amazing thing. It's a totally amazing thing that the fear of failure is the fear that gnaws at the heart of people. The worst thing that can happen to an American or Canadian is to fail. Whatever it is they are, in school, exams, a job, whatever. It starts when you are small. Parents say, what's the matter of you? Look at your sister, look at your brother, look at the next door neighbor, look at the other people doing ministry better than you, right? Look at this priest. They made something of themselves. I remember when I first came to North America, I was in a train station, a small station, and there was a band there. A crowd of people was waiting for the train. So the train arrived and somebody got off and there was applause and the band played and the girls threw batons in the air. I thought to myself, this must be a very important person. He must have done something great. He must have discovered a cure for a disease or done something else to benefit mankind. Finally, when everyone left, I asked the station manager about it. He said that guy made good. He was the son of a poor farmer and he went to the city and he made lots of money. Oh, I said, money? That's why you had a band? Now to me, this man was an absolute failure. To them, he was an absolute success. Many years ago, when I was a nurse, I had a patient who was a hypochondriac. This woman had absolutely nothing the matter with her. So I said to her, lady, why don't you go home and live, give the hospital bed to someone who really needs you? I'm sorry, who really needs it? She reported me. As a nurse, I shouldn't have said it. This was a terrible failure, and after I did it, I knew that. The doctor came to me and the head nurse, and they said, Catherine, what happened to you? And I told her off, sir, I told them. The doctor said, bravo, and the head nurse said, I'm going to ignore this incident. I said, thank you. So that failure turned out all right. But the members of Madonna House know that my name was Mud until Vatican II. Well, not completely, but still, was I a failure? Yes. I was thrown out of Toronto. I was thrown out of Harlem. My road has been one of failure after failure after failure. Generally speaking, there is a very deep and spiritual thing that we need to talk about when we talk about failure. We really need to. We need to acknowledge who we are. We are creatures of God and not God. If we think we can live without ever failing, we're committing blasphemy. Only God is perfect, so only God never fails. What is that deep thing that I'm talking about? It's called humility, plain and simple. Who do you think you are that you can't fail? Pride is one of the terrible sins, but that is what everybody wants to aim at, to be absolutely without failure. But this is absolutely impossible for human beings. So to want it, is to want to be more than human. Christ said, learn from me. I am meek and humble of heart. And we say that we're his followers. Something is utterly, terribly wrong. So acknowledge your failures. The simplest thing is to ask forgiveness. Say, I failed, I'm sorry. 
Acknowledging your failure is not at all anything to be ashamed of. On the contrary, it's something to be proud of. That's the right kind of pride because it's actually humility. Why is there a fear of failure? It's not only the fact that you might lose a job, which you usually don't. It's the fear of disapproval. Yes, behind the desire to succeed lies, of course, the need for approval. And behind this need of approval lies the terrible hunger of people on this North American continent for love. But you are never unloved and you are never alone. And the person you need to go to when you have failed is Jesus Christ. God is in our midst. Christ is with me. Christ is right here. Christ is mercy and love. This is part of our faith. Do I really believe what I say I believe? Do I believe in the mercy of God or not? The thing is that we don't really believe it. This is the thing that just breaks my heart. Why is it that we don't believe it? It's such a simple thing. It's such an obvious thing. You just have to put your hand out and touch the garment of God, like a woman in the gospel. Failure, for Pete's sake, I'll storm heaven for you, so that once and for all, you cry out to God, Lord, I understand that I am human, and I will fail all of my life. Bless my failures. I don't want to make them but please make it so that I do not die inwardly when I fail. I don't know how to explain, how to bring the Lord to your heart so that you understand that he who appeared to be the greatest failure of all loves failure. The Pharisees pointed out and says, look, he eats with sinners. Translated into our modern English, it means, look, he eats with failures, right? Nobody wants to be a failure, except when the moment comes when we can accept being a failure in men's eyes, the moment when we can accept our imperfections, except when the moment comes when we can say, oh Lord, look at me, I'm a sinner, I'm a failure, but come and have supper with me and save me. Don't cry, don't try for the perfection of the world. Try for the perfection that is so imperfect. Try to love everyone, no matter how hurtful that person is to you. They say in the conference that I spoke in New Jersey that Christ builds on our weakness. Let us begin to accept that weakness that Christ wants to build on. And that includes our failures. Look at the failure of Jesus on the cross. You know, when he was there, they said, if you're really the son of God, come down from that cross. He looked like everything had failed. But it was through his weakness, his suffering, his failure, that he did the greatest act, the greatest success that ever has happened in the history of mankind. He opened the gates of heaven he saved us from the fires of hell. He redeemed our sin. He healed our wounds. So I encourage you today to look at your life at the failures and don't be discouraged. God is God and we are not. You know, did you want to open the successful business and it didn't work? And then somebody else did it? And you think, why didn't God bless me? Maybe they had the gifts that God wanted to use. Don't be jealous. Be grateful that God gave you a desire, that you prayed about it, that you tried, that you were obedient, that you were faithful. And it's up to God to decide when and where and through whom he bears what fruit, right? When we go to Mass, we look at Jesus crucified on the altar. At consecration, he's lifting his failure, his bloody, painful, wounded failure with souls up to the Father. It would have looked like a success if the soldiers killing him 
had converted or received some divine strength or vision to not actually follow their orders? What would have happened if the apostles presented themselves and said, kill us instead? And there was a Calvary, you know, with 13 crosses. Wouldn't that have been beautiful? Or what if the Jews had converted all of them? What if when, you know, St. Paul went on his missions, they all converted instead of killing him and the other apostles that, you know, all of them except John were killed and John was exiled to Patmos. Didn't it look like the early church was a failure? But it wasn't. So when you go to mass, put your failures on the altar. Every day, you know, I said to a close priest friend of mine the other day, I feel like all I bring God every day at Mass is my failure at this point. And he said, Mary, isn't that good? Isn't that right? And it is. It is. So we bring God our failures. You know, at the end of the day, when you pray, say, Lord, you know, bless everyone that I touched through what I've said and what I've done. But Bless the souls that I failed. If I said something that hurt them. Anybody I may have sinned against. Any work that you had for me to do that I didn't do. Even people of great goodwill. Like Francis Xavier, who wanted to go to China. Forgot his passport. <laughs> Couldn't God have had the, like the angel remind him or something? But God had a plan to raise up greater missionaries for China. And oftentimes the suffering or the burning desire of the heart of a founder or foundress is then given to their spiritual children. So what they can't do, the children do. So like Charles de Foucault never founded a community, but his children were given that flame through his blood, right? Just like I said, the grapes are crushed and the wheat is crushed. That fire, it was spread. They tried to kill it and they didn't because when they'd kill the martyrs, you know, greater saints were raised up. And we see that with Francis Savior. We see it with all the saints, right? Let's pray that we may be humble enough to recognize our failures, to give them to God. To ask him to give us the grace to correct if the cause of our failure is our own. Just like not knowing or wanting or doing his will correctly. Take our hearts, Lord, right? But then we also have to be humble enough to realize that if he wants fruit born, he'll do it. Everything is grace. It goes back to that song we sing, Use us, Jesus. Take our lives and use us, right? Keep us close to you. But when we're close to Christ, we're close to him crucified. And use us. Only make me what you would have me be, whether it be a success or a failure. I only want to serve you faithfully. Help me, Father, to truly see what you have for me. And if God thinks he can bear greatest, greater fruit from you suffering failure, Rejoice. Remember, this earth is only a very small snippet of our entire existence that will extend into eternity. And it is an honor and a grace for him to humble us through failure and for him to make us perfect through being persecuted with his son, right? You know, if everyone thought that I was, you know, the greatest missionary in Russia or the greatest hermit or the great, right? I wouldn't bear the, the fruit that I have borne. Many women have come forth through the diocese and in other countries have come to me and said, I'm inspired to give my life to Christ like you. Why? Because I failed, kind of, right? You know, you have shown me that a woman just privately consecrated to the Lord has a place in this world. It's beautiful. So let's rejoice when things don't always go the best, you know? 
My book is not going to be a bestseller in the New York Times, at least in my lifetime. But I do pray that it touches enough hearts that they're changed, right? But if God thinks he can convert women better through my not seeing it, through suffering, through giving, I mean, painstakingly working at something so hard and then just not seeing the fruit, right? That's something I can offer to the Lord that's beautiful. Just like he looked like a broken sacrifice, he will bear fruit for eternity, greater than if there was some, you know, huge movement giving accolades everywhere. Sometimes he does it, right? He has different desires for different people, and we have to be content with our place. Just be faithful every day to what he's asked of you, right? You know, if you're a parent and you feel like you failed with your children because they left the church, just be faithful. God has a plan. He's in charge. He's all love, and he will help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, as now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. I forgot, before I go, I forgot, I've got one more saint here, a great failure, Damien of Malachi. You know, in his lifetime, his religious community and the bishops totally rejected him. He prayed when he was taking care of the lepers that God would send him all these people. And like, he'd send a priest and then they'd leave. And like, nothing was successful. And it, they did write positively about him in Europe. You know, he was kind of popular. But the church was not supportive of him where he was. And his, I will never forget when he was dying from leprosy. He had no money he was living in utter poverty and he asked for money to buy wood to make his own coffin. And his superiors accused him of being greedy. That seems like a failure, right? But it wasn't. He was raised up to be a great saint for many, many people. We don't want to forget Damien, right? So thank you and please continue to pray for me. And if you want more information on my other podcasts or the Holiness of Womanhood, my book, and it's, you know, the translations are starting to be accomplished in that. So the Urdu in Pakistan is ready and Polish is almost, I believe Spanish is almost. Um, Arabic and Russian and Italian have failed. <laughs> I've had people offer and begin and then throw it aside. So please pray I find that. And my next book called Out of the Darkness on the Interior Suffering of Christ will be published at Lent, and it's all about the failure, the interior suffering of Christ. So I really encourage you to look forward to that, and I'm sure there'll be many translations of that as well. And if you like the art here of Charles de Foucault or um, Jesus, this is the vision of Fatima, you can look at my artist shop and um, the music and, and the music site. All of that information is found on my website. So you can just go to books or art or music or podcasts, or if you want to pray with us, or if you would like to donate, it would be very helpful to keep my ministry going, to have regular donors at my Patreon account. All of that can be found at www.maryklaskafiat.com. So it's www. M-A-R-Y-K-L-O-S-K-A-F-I-A-T dot com. God bless you.